Amen. It is good to be here tonight. Good to, this morning, excuse me, it's nighttime somewhere. It's so cloudy, you know, the last, I was thankful the sun came out yesterday. Uh, it's been so cloudy the last few days, and it's, again, it's again this morning, you kind of get uh, your mind off of what time of day it is sometimes. But we're thankful for you being here this morning, thankful for the uh, the time of Sunday school this morning, and the songs today as well, and the uh, time of the kids. Get your Bibles, if you will. Turn to Acts chapter 12 this morning. Acts chapter 12. Uh, we're going to pick up in verse number 1 today. Uh, we're going to make you stand for a long period of time this morning too. So if you will, please stand with me in all the Word of God as we read together. Acts chapter 12. Acts 12, verse number 1. The Bible says, about that time, King Herod violently attacked some who belonged to the church. And he executed James, John's brother, with a sword. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We ask now, God, that you'd bless your word. And may you put your words in our mouth to give to your people. Speak to us, strengthen, encourage us, equip us for this uh, coming week uh, to fight the good fight of faith to be strong in your word, to be strong in your will, and to be a light to those that come in contact with. Father, I pray if there's anybody here lost, God, draw them to you, that they'll be saved very, very soon. We love you, we praise you, and direct this time in Christ's name we pray. And amen. You may be seated. May God bless his word uh, this morning. When God doesn't rescue, when God doesn't rescue, now, does Jesus still rescue his people from harm or death? Yeah, he sure does. He still rescues people from harm and from death, but sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he doesn't. So we spent some time with the kids this morning. Sometimes God says no. Sometimes God says no, I'm not going to do that. Not going to rescue, not going to deliver. And we don't understand why. We never will understand why here on this side of heaven. We will understand it in, in, in heaven, I believe, though. We look at this passage, and as we get into it this morning, we can first question that comes to mind, why did God allow James to be killed? James and John were, the, uh, were part of the inner circle along with Peter. Uh, James and John and Peter got to see Jesus transfigured there on the mountain. And wanted to stay up there and, and build tabernacles, one for Moses, one for Elijah, one for you, Jesus. Let's stay here. Why did Jesus, why did God allow James to be killed? Why didn't he just deliver him? Now, we'll get into that next Sunday, and he does deliver Peter. But he doesn't deliver James. And James made a mistake. Is James messed up? Was James too much? A son of thunder? I tried to use the I tried to use the uh, the other word, but I, I can't pronounce that word. So I'm going to, throw, to, to even try. So let's move on. But James and John were called the sons of thunder. Had James made somebody mad that God couldn't help? No. James's witness was silenced by his death, but it was silenced only temporary. Because even today, 2,000 years later or thereabouts, we're still speaking about the Apostle James. His testimony of seeing the things that Jesus did, of seeing Jesus crucified, dead and buried and risen from the dead. Jesus, James saw Jesus walk on the water, open the eyes of the blind, heal the lame, raise the dead. James saw all these things, and we don't have a necessary gospel written by James, but we have his testimony throughout him that he followed Jesus. Yes, just like his brother, like Peter, the night he ran away for a time, but came back and was willing to give his life for Jesus, and he did. Now, look at this. King Herod, as we look at this, this man, uh, Herod was a mortal man like all of us, but he had gotten put in this position as king of this region. Uh, if you dig into his life, he had squandered his wealth, was in a huge amount of debt at one point in time. How he finagled his way in this position, really nobody knows. 
uh, maybe somebody felt sorry for him and put him in this position, or maybe somebody wanted to get rid of him and put him there. Uh, you go be king here. Get away from us. Stephen looked at this passage and he violently attacked some who belonged to the church. And he executed James, John's brother with the sword. You look at verse 3, and we will come back to this next week with the Lord's help, when he saw that it pleased the Jews. Herod was trying to gain favor by a certain group of people. We always want to be liked, right? As a pastor of the congregation, we want you to like us, right? Some of you might not. And I may have made some of you mad over the years. And I, if I have, I apologize. Would never be my church intention to purposely make somebody mad at me or hurt your feelings. Because we want to be there. We want you to be, feel comfortable in talking to us and coming to us for help. Because that's what we're here for. Herod wasn't like that. He wasn't like that. He wanted you to like him. If you didn't like him, then he might just do like he did with James and, and get rid of you. I've not gotten rid of anybody here. I don't have some sword in the back room back here and, and, and waylay people when they leave if they made me mad. Don't do that. If you don't show up for Sunday school, there's going to be a whipping post out front next Sunday, right? No, it's not who we are. When God doesn't rescue, though, he's still God. When God doesn't rescue, he is still God. Herod was not too strong for God. Herod was not too powerful for God. A very prime evidence of this is what happens to Herod at the end of this chapter. If anybody may have been attempted to be too powerful for God, it was Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. When Moses came down there and said, let my people go. And Pharaoh, who, who is God that I should listen to him? Meaning Yahweh, Jehovah. Who is this person that I should listen to him? Well, Pharaoh found out who God was that God was more powerful than all of Pharaoh's supposed gods and more powerful than Pharaoh himself as God took Pharaoh's son from him. James knew Jesus was the Messiah, and he died knowing it. He died, he died knowing it. Now, when you go back and look in the Scriptures, and you find Jesus... As, let's go back to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Jesus is approached by James and John's mother. In John 20, verse 20, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons approached him with her sons. She knelt down and to ask him for something. What do you want? He asked her. Promise, she said to him, that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right and the other on your left in your kingdom. Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am able to drink? About to drink? We are able. Sons of thunder. We are able. They said to him, he told them, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right and left is not mine to give. Instead, it is for those who, to whom it has been prepared for my father. James and John ask uh, to be baptized in the same baptism that John, Jesus was. And that was persecution. Jesus was, is God. James understood this. He unashamedly proclaimed that. One night, he, yeah, one night he messed up. Have you messed up more than once? Hmm? I think we all have. James had wanted to suffer with Jesus. He did. He wanted to be there. Jesus, I, I, I'm, could you imagine being part of the inner circle? The three, James, John, and Peter. Wherever they go, hey, you three come with me. Let's, we're going to go up here on this mountain. You know that built up a little bit of what? Pride, right? Or like thinking, okay, well, I'm doing something right because he's asking me to come with him, a little father. And he went. He saw amazing things. Amazing things. And it changed his life over time. And of course, seeing Jesus resurrected from the dead, that changed his life completely. And he was willing never, ever to deny Jesus again. But it cost him his life. God didn't rescue him. God allowed him to have a painful death by the sword. He was customary. Uh, in, and you read it in the book of uh, Deuteronomy. I don't have it wrote down here, but you'll find that 
that was part of the, the law of God. And if somebody was teaching about some false god, you were to take that person and slay them with the sword. But you, 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 gotta, you gotta dig more into that too. You read on in there where it talks about not only do you kill that person who's been teaching about some false god, you kill him, but you kill everybody in the whole city. Well, they didn't, the, Herod didn't do that. Because he'd done that, he had nobody to, to, to be king over if he killed them all. They killed James with the sword because they said James is preaching and teaching about some other God. They wouldn't. He was preaching about the true and living God, the only God. That's what cost James his life. God didn't rescue him. James was only killed, though, because God allowed it. Herod didn't care about God. Herod didn't care about Jehovah God, the Jewish God. He didn't care about him at all. He didn't care about Rome's gods. Herod only cared about himself, about his power, his influence. He's not the same as the, the one you read in the book of Luke, the first, chapter, first two chapters there, different Herod. But he's in the same line. He only cared about himself. James cared about Jesus. He cared about the word of God and it being proclaimed. James is only killed because God allowed it. Jesus only died on the cross. Why? Because he allowed it. Jesus gave up his life. The soldiers didn't take it. Jesus gave his life up for us. Do you see? So when God doesn't rescue, he's still God. When God doesn't rescue, he is still king. He is still king. Herod, as I mentioned earlier, was a mortal man who deemed himself to be great. But his life detailed a very different story. Very different story. Terrible ruler. Terrible king. Had no wisdom. He should have been like Solomon and asked God to give him wisdom to lead the people. But he didn't. Give me riches. I'm in debt. Bail me out. Help me out here. Herod believed he had ultimate authority. But then he came across the king of kings. He took one of Jesus' apostles and put him to death and saw that it pleased the Jews, the people under him. Hey, hey, this is great. Finally, I got them on my side now, you know? But he didn't understand who the king of kings was. Now, back over in Proverbs, uh, can I give you a homework and read the entire book of Proverbs? Huh? Hey, who would do that? You got 31 chapters in there? You got 31 days in the month? Who, who can make it? That's amazing how that works out, ain't it? Except, well, Paul, February is short. I know. Uh, Proverbs 21. A king's heart is like channeled water in the Lord's hand. He directs it wherever he chooses. Do you see that? The king's heart is like channeled water in the Lord's hand. He directs it wherever he chooses. So as God cut out the Nile River, and made it go the direction he wanted it to go when he created this earth. So there God says that he can guide the king's heart and direct it where he wants it to go as well. Over in Daniel uh, chapter number 2. I'll get there in just a second. I should have bookmarked these a little better, but you get what you get. You've been around me long enough. Uh, Daniel 2 verse number 21. Uh, page turn. The Bible says here, Back up to verse 20. The, and he declared, May the name of God be praised forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. He changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals the deep and hidden things. He knows what it is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. I offer thanks and praise to you, God of my fathers, because you have given me wisdom and power, and now you have let me know what you, we have asked of you, for you have let us know the king's mystery. If you remember, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Nobody can understand it. Nobody can interpret it. Nobody realized what it was going on. And 
Nebuchadnezzar got so mad as the king, if his men couldn't answer the question, I'll replace you. Get rid of these guys. I want somebody who can answer my questions. And so he gave the order to, to annihilate all the astrologers, soothsayers, uh, wise men of the day, which included Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Daniel acted with wisdom, though, and asked for some time. Hey, give me some time. Went back to his three friends and said, pray, ask God for wisdom, and, and answer this question, this dream that the king has been given. And God gave them the interpretation of the dream, and Daniel gave it to the king. And God elevated Daniel in Nebuchadnezzar's presence. And then Nebuchadnezzar elevated Daniel in the presence of all the people. Who was in charge then? God was. God was in charge in that moment in time. God's the one who gave Nebuchadnezzar the dream. He was the one who gave Daniel the interpretation. He was the one who put it in Nebuchadnezzar's heart to raise Daniel up over the kingdom. The same way with the other Pharaoh when Joseph saved them from famine. God put it in Pharaoh's heart to elevate Joseph in the second in charge of Egypt. God was in charge of the king. He guided them. Now we look at all these evil kings. The king in Jesus, when Jesus was born, that Herod. He, why did God allow all those boys to be murdered in Bethlehem? I don't know. He's still God though. He's still the king of kings. Herod did not understand who he was fighting against when he killed James. He didn't understand what he, who he was going against when he imprisoned Peter. Paul didn't understand who he was fighting against on the road to Damascus when he, tried to, when he was trying to annihilate all the Christians, wasn't he? Until he met the king of kings himself. Jesus is our king. He's our king. He's all-powerful. He's omnipotent. He's everywhere. He's omnipresent. He knows all. He's omniscient. He's all these things. We don't have to fear. But sometimes the king doesn't rescue. Sometimes he allows his subjects, his children, his servants to suffer. Think about the Apostle Paul, you go read there in Corinthians, when he's writing them in 2 Corinthians about all these super apostles that were there. Super apostles. These guys who had been supposedly great teachers, had done all these amazing things, the Spirit of God was on them, supposedly. And they were talking about how Paul was insignificant and it didn't matter what he said, it's what we say. Paul says, let me tell you about something about these guys. These guys have no idea what I have suffered for and through in the name of Jesus. These guys haven't suffered anything. And Paul lists all these things. He said, four times I was beaten 40 times minus one. I mean 39. The Jews thought it was too hard, too, it was too cruel to beat somebody 40 times with a whip or the rod. So they cut it off at 39. Merciful, right? Huh? Merciful. Children, your parents have beat you 30, 39 times. Son, I could have gave you 40 whippings, but I only gave you 39. Be thankful, right? Huh? No mercy there. Sometimes the king doesn't deliver. We look at Paul's life. We've been studying about him in 2 Timothy. Finished that up last Wednesday. How... Yeah, in that letter there, he's writing his last words. Paul had been delivered from the Romans. He had been delivered from the Jews. He had been delivered over and over in a shipwreck, beatings. He got beaten Philippi so bad they thought he was dead. And maybe he was dead, and God sent him back. Hey, you, ain't, you can't die now. Get back down there. But then he got in prison again, and God didn't deliver him. He could have. Let me remind you, that the King of Kings hung on a cross and died for your sins and my sins. But the King of Kings could have called angels to come down and rescue him from there. He could have. He could have said one word. And all the angelic hosts showed up in all their amazing glory, in all their power and majesty, and slain every human being in that region. And on the earth. Think about that. Just, just one angel annihilated 185,000 Assyrian warriors in one night. One. Imagine if you called a whole legion, what would happen? 
But the King of kings, Lord of lords, God, he didn't rescue He didn't rescue himself. The Father didn't rescue the Son on the cross. He allowed him to die. Just as Jesus allows James to die here. He's still God. He's still the King. And he has a purpose. He had a purpose in allowing James to die here. He had a purpose in allowing Peter to be arrested next. He had a purpose in allowing Paul to suffer all that he did for Jesus. He, Jesus wasn't trying to balance Paul's books either. Okay? Let me, let me tell you, let me, let me explain that to you for a moment. If you look at the apostle Paul's life and all that he did before he met Jesus uh, and devote himself to the law of God knowing what it was, being a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Probably being, if, you, if you'd met him before he met Jesus, he would have nothing to do with you because you weren't like him. God can completely change that man around. But he had suffered a lot. He had persecuted. He stood there and agreed when Stephen was stoned. He had dragged people who were Christians and put them in prison, had them executed and all these other things he did. He was on his road to Damascus to get more and arrest more to silence this message about Jesus. When Jesus met him and changed his life, suddenly now Paul's preaching about Jesus Christ, about people being born again by the grace of God, writing all these letters we have. God was not trying to balance out Paul's books. God doesn't save somebody and then go through the rest of their life balancing out their bad deeds or the good deeds. He doesn't do that. Prime example, the thief on the cross. That dude was so in debt to God he had no time, though, after his salvation to balance his books, did he? Do you understand what I'm saying? You cannot balance your books. The king can, though. He had a purpose in allowing that thief to go through his entire life, murderer, thief, whatever he may have been. He had a purpose in allowing him to do all those things that he did and wind up in the Jerusalem prison at the very same time that Jesus got thrown in there, ha, and the same time that Jesus was crucified was the same time this thief was going to be, God had a purpose. Hanging on, the, hanging on the same hill, different trees on the same hill, dying at the same time as Jesus. There were two thieves up there. One just ridiculed Jesus. You're the Messiah. Get us down from here. The other one said, don't you know we deserve what we're getting? We deserve this because of how evil we've been. We deserve this. But this man's done nothing wrong. Jesus, will you remember me when you get into your kingdom? Huh, 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 huh. Ain't no bouncing books going on but that man. But the king of kings said that day, well, okay, yeah, today you'll be me with me in Paris. The books were balanced. Jesus had a purpose in allowing that man to be crucified too. He had a purpose in James dying. He had a purpose in Peter being uh, arrested as well. All persecution is purposeful. It is. Ultimately, it is to draw us closer to God and to make our faith stronger. Blessed are the persecuted for my name's sake. Blessed are you when you're persecuted for my name's sake. Hmm. James' death caused the church to cry out to God. It did. Along with Peter getting in prison and James' death, the church, man, they had a, just a revival of prayer. It brought this church together to pray even harder and to cry out to God. Do you know what James is doing now? Hmm. He ain't suffering. He's not suffering. He's praising God. He's not thinking about his being executed with the sword. Did it hurt? I'm sure it did. I'm sure it was painful. I'm sure there was fear there. I'm sure there was just an, an, an understanding. Of, I don't know why this is happening. But all that doesn't count anything to him anymore because he's with the king. God had a purpose in allowing James to be executed. 
It showed the church also, which you, you have to read into it as you look at the passage and look at the rest of the church, that the apostles were being just like them. We've seen it when Peter went to Cornelius, that the Peter, Cornelius first wanted to worship Peter. Later when Paul and Barnabas, or maybe in Silas, when they go to one place and, and they, they heal this man and, and the people come out and begin to worship them as gods. And, and some false priest comes out and begins to make a sacrifice in their name. No, 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 no. Don't worship us. Worship Jesus. God was showing the church that these men are just like them. Don't worship Peter. Don't worship James. Don't worship John. And I know we've got a denomination of Christianity that, 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 that prays to these men. Those men can't answer your prayers. Only Jesus can. Only Jesus can answer your prayers because he's the king. The rest of us are just messengers of the gospel. That's all Peter was. That's all James was. That's all Paul was. Messengers of the gospel. Jesus is the one who answers prayers because he's the king. He has a purpose in all persecution. And I know I mentioned it, I, I just mentioned it earlier and kind of flew by it real quick. I know. Let me read to you what Paul suffered. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12. <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse number 1. Boasting is necessary. It is not profitable. But I will move on to visions and revelations in the Lord. I know a man in Christ who was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether he was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. I know if this man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a human being is not allowed to speak. I will boast about this person, but not about myself, except of my weaknesses. For if I want to boast, I wouldn't be a fool, because I would be telling the truth. But I will spare you, so that no one can credit me with something beyond what he sees in me or hears from me especially because of the extraordinary revelations. Therefore, so that I would not, I would not, say it again, I would not exalt myself, Paul says. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment me, so that I would not exalt myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God has a purpose in not rescuing. What that purpose may be, that's his purpose. We will discover it as we go along in this life or when we get to heaven. I don't have all the answers. If you came today for all the answers, well, I don't have them, but I know who does. His name is Jesus. Back in chapter 11, you'll, you can, Paul details all his sufferings he went through. He said, okay, whatever. Here I am now. I'm going to boast in what God's done for me. Paul didn't boast in what he saw in heaven and what he heard in heaven. Paul boasted in that God's grace was sufficient for him. I heard God's grace is sufficient for you, no matter what you or your family are going through in this moment. I know we've got a lot of people we're praying for, for he to be healing, to be healed. A lot of people were praying for to be saved. A lot of people were praying for for other issues of life. And God has the power to answer all those prayers in the positive. I know he does. I know he can. And if it's his will, he will do it. But God may not rescue some that are sick. He may not rescue some that are dying. He may not. He may not rescue in this life. He didn't rescue James. But guess where James is at now? He doesn't want to come back here. He's with Jesus. He's with him. 
our understanding, our desire should be that we are where God wants us to be. And that's where James was. He was in the will of God when he died. And he woke up, guess where he was at? In the will of God. Ain't that amazing? Praise the living God. When I die, I want to be in his will because I know when I wake up, I'm going to be in his will. But I want to leave this place in his will too. That's why I mentioned when sometimes we don't, the kids, we don't get our way, I don't want God to find me pouting when he comes. I don't want God to find me pitching a fit when he comes. Hmm? Now, you understand what I'm saying? Does that, that click with anybody? I don't want God to find me complaining like the Israelites and like we all do here at times in our life. Oh, woe is me. Nobody's ever had it as bad as me. Wait to hear what Job went through. Let me know. Let me know if you want to take Job. Let me know if you want to trade Job's persecutions for your own. Let me know. How many kids have you lost? And I know some of you in here have lost kids. And it's heartbreaking. It's, it's despairing. I know. It's sad. God also gave Job back, not those same kids, but a whole new set. Those who have lost children, who knew the Lord, were too young to understand, guess what? I know where they are. When I leave this place, we're going to find them here. We're going to find them there, I mean. We're going to find them there. Guess what we'll be? In the will of God. God has a purpose. We don't always know what it is. We don't always know why. And sometimes I know that question, why, is never ending. I know. But we have to understand, God has a purpose. There's a song we sing, we'll understand it better by and by, and we will. We will understand it. We will. Right now, for us as God's people, persecution is coming. Persecution is coming. It's already here. We've been preaching on it that for, for years now. I know, years now, preparing ourselves for it. It's here. It's here. People don't want to hear us. People don't want to listen to us in our message. People don't want to follow Jesus any longer. They don't like it. It's too hard, too difficult. Some of, that, some of those reasons I know are because of how sinful the world is and such. Sometimes also the reasons why is the church doesn't give them a reason why to follow Jesus. We as God's people, James gives me a reason why to follow Jesus. What were those reasons? He left his job. He left his father and followed Jesus. That's what he did. He left everything he knew behind and followed Jesus. He did that's what Jesus asked of us. But too many people in the church today, maybe not here, I'll let, you, I'll let God deal with that, but too many in the people of the church today, they got one hand in the bowl of the world and the other hand reaching out to Jesus when they think they need him. Only when they think they need him. When the bowl of the world gets a little too low, you, you, have you ever had your favorite candy in a bowl and you, 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 you hit it often and you just keep going there and then somebody else starts getting in there and you go in there one day and there's nothing in there? And you reach up for the bag you got hidden in the cabinet somewhere and they've gotten in it too? Hmm? Can I get a witness? So you got to go buy more and put it in the bowl, Right? That's what we do. That's how the world operates. We, we go get when we run out. Instead, if we would just hold on to Jesus, we never run out. Not candy. Not money. But of grace. What did Paul say? My, what, did Paul, what did Paul report to us that Jesus told him? My grace is sufficient for you. For in your weakness... In your weakness, I'll show myself to be strong for you. 
Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. We love you. We take now, your, we ask that you take your word and do what you need to with it. God, for those who need help this morning, we pray you'll grant that help. For those who need grace, may you grant that. For those who need healing, may you heal. For those who need to be saved today, most importantly, may you save their souls today. We give you this time and thank you for it. In Christ's name we pray and amen.